I was on stage in Nashville at RubyConf 2019, where I was talking about how we adopted Sorbet at Shopify scale. Um, and since then, it's been about three years um, from when we started adopting Sorbet on our code base. Um, so it sounded like a good opportunity to take a step back and share some of our learnings and share, do a small retrospective. But before we go into that, I want to talk a little bit about gradual typing. So a lot of the conversation in Ruby today is centered around static typing. But we would like to call it gradual typing instead of static typing for a few reasons. Ruby, as we all know, is a dynamically typed language. Um, and we love Ruby because it's dynamic, because it gives us things like Rails, which build on the full dynamic nature of the language. At the same time, static analysis is a fast and powerful tool. For example, on our code base, our core monolith at Shopify, Sorbet can do full parsing, understanding, and type checking over over 40,000 files in seconds. So in this example, it takes about 25 seconds to run on a developer machine. This is impressive because um, Sorbet doesn't have to run our code. It doesn't have to load our code. It doesn't have to do anything. It can do all of this statically, and that's really fast and powerful. But we also don't want to turn Ruby into another language, something like a coffee-flavored language, for example. At the same time, our code bases are huge. At Shopify, like I said, we have over 40,000 Ruby files in our color monolith. And if we wanted to do static typing, it would mean that we would have to add types to all of our files, or maybe even better, we would have to rewrite our code base in a different language. But we don't want to. We love Ruby. So gradual typing is the best middle ground. And the reason why we like to call it gradual typing is because you don't have to go full in on types from the get-go. You can adjust the level of adoption that you want um, as little or as much as you want. So that's why we'll be talking about gradual typing and not just static typing. Um, before we embarked on this journey, there were like few challenges that we needed to solve. Um, as a technical team, it's very easy to concentrate on the technical challenges that you should be solving. But the more important problems are the human challenges. How do we make it easy for teams to adopt this new gradual typing in our code base? That's an important question. And if you can't solve that, then the adoption is going to falter. And what benefits do those teams get through the adoption? If we don't explain that very clearly, then people will not do the adoption. And more importantly, how do we advertise those benefits? It's not enough that the benefits are there. They need to be understandable and knowable by the people. But then obviously there are also technical challenges. Um, Ruby, like we said, is a very dynamic language. We always create classes and methods at runtime. Like in this example, there's a new module being created at runtime, which defines a method at runtime. And this can be conditional as well. So it's impossible to statically type check or even understand what this code is doing without actually running it. Moreover, the dependencies that we use, the gems that we rely on, are basically black boxes, right? When you add a dependency on a gem, how do you know how it works? You either look at the documentation or you look at the source code. There are no other artifacts telling you what classes are exported, what modules exist, or what methods there are, or let alone what parameters those methods take. So as far as static typing tools are concerned, dependencies are black boxes. So this is a big technical challenge as well. How did we meet those challenges? Alex, maybe you can take that. So yeah, first, before deciding to introduce a new thing in Shopify culture and like asking all developers to use gradual typing, we wanted to make sure that we were actually making the right decision and that using gradual typing will be beneficial for us without seeing us down. So we built a series of experiments to test our hypothesis and making sure that gradual typing using Solve in this case was actually the right choice. We started by gradually type and moved to type force some of the files that needed at this point, Solve checking 
or are like the constants that you use in, uh, in your file, like the cloud somewhere. And it, uh, is there like syntax errors? And as soon as we try, we started migrating some of these files by force, we realized that we were not seeing any more syntax errors and name errors in production. So less of those errors reaching production, while a very minimal cost that was to just like add the system on top of the files and monitoring them and so on. Then, still gradually, we started to move some of the files. Like we can see a cluster of green files that means that they are like type true. We started to move them where in a state where somebody actually check what are the methods that are called on the on the type reader on the constant we use, and we realized that we, we were seeing less nominal errors appearing in production. I'm seeing less and not no more because we still use meta programming, for example, Rails, and some of those things we cannot check with Sorbet yet. So we realized that Sorbet was bringing more rigor into the way we were coding and into our monoliths. We were uh, realizing that the signatures were bringing uh, evergreen documentation. It was uh, making it easy for teams to communicate over like what were the expectations of the method they were writing and kind of like creating contracts between them. So it seemed to be the right choice for us. And because we could go gradually, just like the five by five, it was actually compatible with the way we continue to grow the monolith. But to make this happen and to make it possible for all the teams and all the developers to actually use Sorbet, we had to build a lot of tooling around Sorbet itself and contribute to Sorbet too. Uh, just remember that when we started this journey in January uh, 2019, uh, Sobe was still uh, having a lot of uh, rough edges. So the first thing we did was creating RoboCop Sobe, which is an open source set of uh, rules for RoboCop that helps to that helps for Sobe adoption. That means that when you have a code base and you have to operate a few changes on this code base to make it Sobe compatible, for example, removing, changing the const get that you might be using in your, const, in your, in your code base, uh, you can use RoboCop Sobe to help you automate this change and thanks to the autocorrect, uh, go faster in your adoption of Sobe and also keep your code base uh, compatible with Sobe. Then, like I've presented before, we have this problem of gems being kind of black boxes. The problem is Sobit does not open the gems you are like linking in your, in your, pro, in your application at that time. So Sobit does not know that this constant or this method is coming from this gem. So we had to find a solution for this, and we created a solution in view of Tapioca. Uh, Tapioca, which is the Swiss army knife of RBI generation in its first version, uh, was able to load the gems that your application is requiring as gem file and create uh, interface fail files for Sorbet to be able to understand what is coming from these gems. So if you, in your gem file, you have a dependency to gem A, which declares a few constants and methods, Tapioca can find these constants and methods and create files that teach Sorbet that can exist. The next step was all the GSLs that means that a lot, like we said before, a lot is happening at runtime, time, especially like module being created, method being created, and we need a way to, to teach Sorbe or to understand those things without running the, the, the application itself. So again, in the, the solution was in Tapioca. We created a second version of Tapioca where Tapioca loads your application, realize everything that is, uh, you find everything that you use at runtime. For example, if you use uh, active record, what are like the types that will exist, what are the methods that will be defined, and again, create RBI files that Sorbet can understand and use to type check your program and know that this method is actually existing at runtime, even if there are no static artifacts inside your code base about this. So this tool is also open source and you can use it, finding on, uh, on our GitHub. To make Tapioca happen, we needed a framework to generate RBI files and read them so we can modify them, then save them again on disk. So we also open sourced RBI, which is an RBI generation framework, and that helps us to uh, create uh, RBI files, format them, change them, and save them onto disk. Then, after being able to actually use Sorbet on a code basis, we wanted to know how much it was adopted by your, by your teams and how much it was like penetrating your culture. So we created this internal um, Sorbet adoption dashboard that's called Sorbet Metrics that help us visualize how much of Sorbet is present in the code bases, uh, in how many code bases, and which uh, strictness is used, what is the 
the, the work that is still to be done on, uh, on this code base is to make them like at a stricter type, uh, stricter level of typing. And because we wanted to be able to share this with the community, we also open source this inside Spoom, which is our uh, toolbox of, uh, for sub enthusiasts that brings all the visualization that we're using in our internal, um, internal dashboard to the open source community. It's also coming with a few tools to uh, bump your files to higher strictness automatically, verify that the higher strictness possible is used in the file, to also communicate with Sorbe over uh, language server protocol. And so anything you want to build on top of Sorbe, you could be using Spoon to do so. And thanks to all those tools, uh, especially Sorbe metrics and Spoon, we wanted to make the progress visible, both for us, for our team, to see like how much we're actually able to type Ruby and Ruby on Rails, and also for the teams using Sorbe and know in their component or the part of the code base or their, their project, how much of uh, typing they are putting. So using Sorbe metrics, and actually this report is uh, generated by Spoom itself, we can have this kind of dashboard where we see like how much of the files are like still like type false, which is in, the, in red here, or at type true, which is in green, or the higher strictness, which is like the darker greens. We can see like the, the progression in this code base and how much of the, of the files has been, have been typed as we are going uh, over time. And we can see, for example, that in our monolith right now, we have like uh, only 8% of files that are still at type false. That means like something like 39, uh, 39,000 files at type true, which is very, uh, very encouraging for us. It also comes with this nice uh, circle map that shows you what is the shape of uh, your code base and where is the strictness. So you can see that the green dots, the small green dots are actually like the files. The strictness is uh, like either green or red, depending on the strictness used. And the more the circular dark, the darker green the circular are, the more strictness you have in, those, uh, in this area of the code. This is very nice for teams to understand where they should be putting their efforts to bring more typing in their code base or in the part of the code base. And this is very interesting also for us when we zoom in to select pockets of red files. That means that these files uh, generally go together here, for example, here are the helpers, and they are not typed yet because maybe one feature is missing either in Tapioca or in Sorbe that we will need to implement to make it easier for those teams to actually uh, migrate those files to grid. We use Sorbet metrics also to track the general adoption in different projects. We're currently uh, over like 80%, uh, sorry, 80, 80 projects at Shopify using Sorbet. And having this adoption, we also want people to be using our tooling. That means that we want other people than our team to be running Sorbet and the different tools we provide. If not, we lost. We want all the people to be tight checking the code there by themselves. So we also track the general usage by users. Uh, how many users run uh, the comments how many times? And for example, here we can see that we have like over uh, a, few a few hundred users, uh, distinct users running Sorbet more than a few thousand times a day, either on CI, on their local machine. And it's super interesting to see them like running this on their local machine. That means they're catching type errors even before running the full suite in, uh, on CI. That means you're saving time, feed a faster feedback loop, everybody's happy. At the same time, we also want to encourage people to add more strictness uh, into their part of the code base. So we created this, uh, what we call the core to true dashboard, which is the effort to bring what the whole core uh, of the whole monolith of Shopify at, core to uh, at the type to, uh, at the strictness true. That means that we have um, a script using Spoon that is like computing what is the list of files still at type false and what are the errors that will appear in those files if we were migrating them to type true. And we create issues with this content that we make available to all developers so they can find, uh, they can filter by the, the component or the kind of errors they're looking for and find what are the files that they should be uh, still working on. And at the end of the day, every file that has been migrated and merged into master, uh, into the main branch, sorry, uh, is closing, the script is closing the issue for this. So it's kind of a bit of a gamification of the typing where we see like developers being very eager to not have any issue related to their part of the code base and doing the effort to going through those files and closing them and pinging us to say like, hey, if I, uh, I fixed this and uh, I migrated this one to true, can you take a look please? So it's very encouraging too. And having these metrics is very useful for us because we can also like motivate people and show like component by component and compare components and saying, oh, the, let's praise those teams because they did a really great job like migrating their component to, uh, to type true 
and maybe we can also spot teams that will might that might need help to go further. So with all of this, what we wanted was to actually treat all developers at Shopify as customers. We are providing solution for them in the lieu of Tapioca, Spoom, Sorbe, and like different uh, the different solution we provide for them to have better typing. And they are basically our customers. And what you do when you have customers, first, you try to understand their need and their satisfaction. So we run periodic surveys asking them, oh, what do you think about the static typing situation at Shopify? About our tooling, what do you want us to look at next? What will be like the next feature you will you, you will uh, like to work faster and ship faster with fewer bugs? So it gives us a better understanding of what the general population of developers or customers at Shopify want to want us to work on next. And like you do when you have customers and you create a solution, you also provide uh, very ex uh, exhaustive documentation. So we have a lot of internal guides on how to use. Uh, Sorbet in Shopify Core, on to bring Sorbet to other projects than Shopify Core. Uh, we created this uh, exhaustive Sorbet error reference that for each error of code that Sorbet could be, uh, could be generating when it's finding a type error, it explains the, what is the type error, why this is, this is a problem, how to fix it, generally using uh, real examples that we find on a code basis and real fixes that we applied. And we try to provide, to provide as much guidance as we can for example, uh, around like what kind of patterns can you use to better type your application. And like you will do when you have customers, when you have a problem with your solution, you should be providing support. So we have this uh, uh, running support uh, on Slack where we provide like a support rotation and the developer can ask in real time question about like, oh, I'm, I'm stuck with this. Or can I like type with this? And we're trying as much as we can to um, move these people to use this course so they can be like more self-serving. A solution where they ask question and they answer themselves. And we try to create using this course like a better understanding of what is Sorbet and gradual typing in Ruby to kind of like move the era, general erudition about, uh, about typing in Ruby up in the, in the company. And I will uh, give the, the mic back to Ufuk so he can tell us about the, the learnings we made. Thank you, Alex. Um, so after doing all this work and after like three years, uh, we've spent um, doing gradual types adoption in our code base, what are some of the learnings? So I want to, before we go into technical learnings, I want to again point out um, a methodology that really worked for us. And this is the lean methodology, the build, measure, learn loop. Um, and the tighter you can execute this, the more progress you can make in the right direction. So what we've been trying to do is to build something small to um, show that to our customers who are the internal developers in our case, as early as possible, and then to measure um, the effect and the impact of that, and then to take those learnings and then decide on what we want to build next. Um, we've realized that that's a good way of building a product. And on that note, like Alex said, we've been treating our developers, internal developers as our customers, and we're fully aware that we're actually building a product for them. And we're, we're not falling into the pitfall of, oh, we're just trained, uh, creating a technical solution. We're actually building a product that real people will be using to get their jobs done. Um, on the technical side, we've quickly realized that if you, the longer you stay on typed ignore for your files, uh, the more technical debt you're incurring. So for, for Sorbet, when you have a file at typed ignore, Sorbet completely ignores that file. So it doesn't even read it. So it doesn't consider anything that's inside that file. So for example, if you have a class foo in a file and you've marked it as typed ignore, but then you have another file that's declaring a bar that subclasses from foo um, and you want to type that file, now you will get errors because Sorbet doesn't know what, what foo is because it's never at the original file. So this becomes infectious. We did need to be on typed ignore for a lot of files uh, early on in our adoption, but we quickly realized that this was a losing game so we built our tooling to make sure that we've moved out of typed ignore as fast as we can. Um, so our recommendation is to aim for typed false on your original uh, adoption and then to move up from there and to completely not have typed ignore at all. Um, we only have about a handful of files in our 40,000 file code base uh, that are typed ignore and those are like either hard to type or very standalone files. Um, we also realized that it's very important to keep things up to date automatically or to force people to keep things up to date. 
Um, we have various um, CI um, processes that make sure that things are um, synchronized. Uh, for example, this is a screenshot from one of our CI checks that makes sure that all the files can be, uh, are at the strictness level that they can, uh, the highest strictness level that they should be at. Uh, for example, in this case, by the way, this is a spoon command that's running. So this is available um, in open source. You can use the same thing in your code bases on your CI as well. So this spoon command makes sure that there are no files that can be bumped to type true in this case. Uh, in this case, there is one file, so we create an error that the user has to fix uh, to um, continue with their PR. Um, similarly, we talked about DSL RBI files. So uh, these are the files that um, decode the meta programming that's happening in your code base. Uh, but these quickly get out of sync. So for example, if you add a new active record model in your code base, it needs to have a matching DSL RBI file. If it doesn't, then someone else is going to have type checking problems. So this is a check on CI again using tapioca in verify mode to make sure that the RBI files are in sync. And again, in this case, a few files were out of sync. So we actually failed the build. Um, we could have done the same thing for gem RBIs as well, but we chose not to do that automatically or as a CI check. The reason for that is we try to stay on the latest version of our gem dependencies as much as possible, and we try to automate that as much as possible through tools like Dependabot. But if we enforce the RBI files to also be generated for every version of the gem, then that's going to create friction for that other security process. So we didn't want to do that. So we don't actually have automated checks for uh, synchronization, but we actually have scheduled uh, runs that bump the um, versions of the R gem RBI files periodically, and the process creates a pull request that is manually reviewed and merged. Um, we also learned that it's good to be patient. So Alex talked about some of the surveys we've been running um, with our internal developers. We've been asking them since uh, 2019 if Sorbet is easy to use on Shopify core, or our core monolith. And early on, you can see like the, the impressions aren't very favorable. Uh, but when it comes to 2021, the impressions are way more favorable. Uh, it's still not perfect, obviously, but more people are actually thinking it's easier to use Sorbet on core. And this is also a testament to some of the work we've been doing to make the tools easier to use and uh, creating documentation and better support uh, from our team as well. At the same time, originally when we asked people if Sorbet ever caught an error in their code, the responses were 50-50. But now, two years later, 78% um, of people are actually saying that Sorbet caught an error in their code, and most probably before it was shipped to CI or let alone production. So this is really good. And this is also a result of the increased typing in our code base over the two years as well. Um, we've also been asking people if they want a friendlier syntax because one of the complaints we've been hearing is the Sorbet syntax is like a little bit cumbersome. And originally lots of people thought that too. Um, but you can see that the numbers are uh, dropping as people are becoming more familiar with, with Sorbet and how to use it. Um, and we've also been asking them if they wanted Sorbet to be used and applied in other Shopify projects that are outside our core monolith. And again, originally people um, weren't um, really hot on that, uh, but over time they see the benefits, they understand the benefits, and they've been asking for Sorbet to be implemented in other projects, even without being um, triggered by our team, we are seeing adoption grow. Um, another thing we've learned that use the right tooling is an accelerator. Um, for example, we've been a beta, beta testing the Visual, um, Source, Visual Studio Code um, extension of Sorbet um, that brings the language server protocol in your editor. And we've realized that that's a huge accelerator. So being able to see Sorbet violations inside your editor is huge. But more than that, autocomplete is amazing and refactoring is even more amazing. So the Sorbet um, integration uh, is actually able to um, rename your constants or rename your methods across your whole code base. Uh, and it makes sure that there are no like instances that are left unrenamed. Um, we've heard over and over again that this type of refactoring is 
um, improving people's lives and making them uh, more productive. We've also heard from people that um, the fact that Tapioca is generating RBI files for gem dependencies makes it easy to understand what is being exported from a gem. So it actually kind of creates a documentation that lives in your code base. Um, you don't have to go and look up the method definition. You can just go to the RBI file and see what the parameters of a method are or what methods there are on a class or a module. Um, we've also learned that it's not enough to just use the tools or to build um, your own tools. We need to also fill the gaps. So we had to contribute heavily to Sorbet. Um, so Stripe is not a Rails shop, but we're a Rails shop. So we have a little bit of a different problem. Uh, we needed Sorbet to understand some of the Railsisms. For example, active support concerns are used heavily in Rails code bases. And Sorbet didn't really have a good understanding of concerns. Uh, so we had to contribute that. Uh, similarly, we try to stay on the newest version of Ruby in our code base. We try to do our migration uh, one or two months after a new version of Ruby is released. And Sorbet needs to understand the new syntax that's coming with each Ruby version. And we've actually been helping the Sorbet team uh, to migrate the, the Sorbet syntax, the Sorbet parser to 2.5, 2.6, 2.7 and lately uh, to the 3.0 syntax as well. Uh, so it's not enough to just use the tools. You need to also contribute back, fill the gaps to make the tools better for yourself and for the whole community. And the final lesson is you shouldn't be getting in the way of people doing work. If you want adoption to happen, you need to ramp up gently and this ties back to the concept that I was emphasizing at the beginning of the talk, that we're doing gradual type adoption. And because this is gradual type adoption, it's totally okay to start slow, to start at the low strictness levels, and then to gradually turn it up as people are more comfortable uh, and as you are more comfortable using the tools. If you get in people's ways, they will stop using the tools that you give them. Um, so go gently go slow and build on the full gradual nature of the typing work we're doing. And on that, we wish you a happy typing. Thank you. All right, if we have time for questions. Uh, various uh, things that you tested to get improvements. Can you speak to the friction you may have experienced from going from dev to staging to production in doing this and also any performance improvements or losses that came uh, as a result of intro introducing these things? Do you have any thoughts on those? Okay, just, just to make sure I'm understanding the question, uh, let me just repeat the question back. So you're asking, um, what was the journey going from development to CI to production, and if we had any performance implications going there, right? Um, Correct. Okay. Um, so the journey going from development to CI to production is actually quite seamless um, with Sorbet, but there is a performance implication because Sorbet does runtime type checking as well. Um, and runtime ch type checking is obviously going on in the background. It's, using CPU cycles as well. So it actually has a performance hit. Um, in our case, uh, we decided that we don't want that to run in production. So we've been turning off runtime type checking in production environments, but we're running the runtime type checking on development and test environments. And because of the gradual nature of typing, runtime type checking is actually very helpful because it sometimes catches some of the assumptions that you're making that were wrong. Uh, so it's very fruitful to, to run with that runtime type checking on in test at least, uh, but we didn't want the performance overhead in production, so we've been turning it off. Um, what is your um, stack in production? Is it AWS or how do you deploy it? Or what do you have in production? Okay, I, um, the question is what is our stack? Um, is it AWS or something else? So we're based in um, the Google Cloud uh, platform. Um, but for more details, I suggest you go to our engineering blog. There's like lots of content talking about our stack. I don't think it's appropriate for me to go into the, all of that here. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. It was excellent. Uh, I'm curious to know about editor integration. You, you mentioned that you have been adopting the VS Code uh, Sorbet uh, like script. Do you have? Um, do you do you know much about who uses what kind of editors at Shopify and like providing paid pass for them? And here's how you use this system in, in the right way to get a good dev experience. So yeah, I think the, the, so. I believe the question was like. Uh, who is using what IDE, which IDE in uh, ID in uh, Shopify, and what about the uh, integration we can do with Sorbet? So we mostly recommend people to use VS Code. This is our main concern right now. Uh, we also know that people are using RubyMine or either uh, Vim or Emacs. We are also providing solution for them, but like we are very much focusing on VS Code right now. Uh, when it comes to Sorbet, Sorbet is shipped with uh, LSP protocol enabled. So language have a protocol, so you can actually send queries to Sorbet and it ends up back with like, for example, the type checking errors or like the refactoring and everything. So you can plug any kind of ID uh, on top of Sorbet. We have integration with Vim uh, using the base uh, Vim LSP plugins that exist. Same thing for RubyMine. And for Visual Studio Code, we uh, are like currently beta testing the extension created by Stripe. Uh, but I believe you can also like create your own uh, extension if you want. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, I don't think so, but like, if there are more questions, please come find us. Or we have a Discord channel for people who are watching this at home. So please ask questions and we'll answer them there as well. Thank you. Thank you.